Oh, good times. Oh, well, hi there. I'm Pinko Punko, and I'm finally back for whatever reason. Nobody asked. Canada is often seen as a liberal paradise in the international community, and nowhere is this more exemplified than in the gun culture and laws that this country exudes. Ask the average Canadian about their views on gun control, and you'll mostly get a positive reaction. Four out of five Canadians support a ban on assault weapons, and two out of three Canadians support a ban on handguns. The issue was largely unfocused in the Canadian consciousness until recently. The reason for that is there's been a couple high-profile shootings in the past years. Uh, Quebec City, there was a shooting in 2017 of a mosque, and last year in April 2020, there was a 13-hour shooting spree in Nova Scotia. And when you're a Canadian and you think about gun laws and shootings, until recently, it was very easy to kind of categorize it as an American problem. You know, we're next to one of the most populated countries on Earth, and the Second Amendment is all we hear when we see these shootings or gun rights be discussed, the NRA. It's very easy to slip into the mindset of, well, it's different up here, we don't have those things, so I don't see it as big of an issue. But what if I told you that Canada's history of gun control was far more rich, far-reaching, and in certain ways, sinister than you may have been led to believe. From the moment that the French and the English landed on the northern half of Turtle Island in the late 15th and early 16th centuries, guns have been part of the imperialist mission. And through Confederation, both World Wars, the Red Scare, and the depressingly modern phenomenon of mass shootings, guns, and conversely, gun control, have been a huge part of Canadian history. As commentator Martin Friedland said in his report, Gun Control, The Options, A History of Canada social, political, and economic could be written based on the history of our gun control legislation. In this series, we'll talk about the history of gun control from this country's colonial inception to the settler state that it is today. We'll talk about common misconceptions, the climate that encouraged these gun control measures to be passed, and we'll also talk about the legislators' stated reasons for it. And it may be shocking to hear, but some on the left may see that these measures are not always as pure as they may seem. So strap in, load your cartridge, and let's take an aim at Canada and see why the reasons for gun control are not as a sharp shoot as you may think. Sharp shoot, sharp shot. Accurate. Bullseye. Fuck. <laughs> Ever since John Cabot landed on the eastern coast of North America in 1497, guns were there with him. The type of gun that the European explorers had at the time were matchlock, which required a front-loaded powder and ball, and a trigger at the back attached to a match. This match system kind of straight up sucked. Think about it. You're in the heat of battle. You have to load up with incredibly dangerous powder into your gun. You have to take a ball, wrap it in a cloth, shove it in there as tight as you can get it, and right when you're ready to fire on the enemy, the match is wet. So it doesn't even work. Initially, selling weapons to Aboriginal peoples was banned by France and England, but the Dutch had no such ban. After 1636, the French were allowed to sell weapons to indigenous people who converted to Christianity. And soon after, the English sold their weapons to them through the Hudson Bay's company, established in 1670. And it still is alive today! These weapons were usually supplemental to the Aboriginal people who bought them, as their inaccuracy and cumbersome nature made them less suitable than the weapons that had been traditionally used. But since the weapons were loud, boisterous, and a sign of prestige for those who could own one, they were bought and sold between the nations. Conversely, guns by the colonizing Europeans were largely used to hunt and to protect their land claims from the occasional attack they feared from indigenous tribes, but it was largely not considered to be a commonly owned item. Gun laws in this time fell in three broadly different categories. The first was trying to prevent firing a gun in an urban space, and the second which was trying to limit possession in uh, public meetings and polling places. But the third one is much more troubling. As R. Blake Brown notes in his book, Arming and Disarming, The History of Gun Control in Canada, Colonial legislators periodically passed laws limiting gun possession or use when fears rose of foreign incursion or ethic or class upheaval. A notable instance of colonial repression through gun control occurred in 1755. The maritime provinces of Canada housed just over 14,000 Acadians, French settlers who had formed colonies in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick. In the French and Indian War, British America battled New France. As part of that campaign, British America began the Great Expulsion, a deportation of every Acadian. Of those 14,000 Acadians, approximately 11,500 were deported and approximately a third of those who fled died from drugs.
drowning and disease. But a key aspect of this genocide is showcased in the gun control measures enacted by Lieutenant Governor Charles Lawrence. After 400 firearms were seized from the Acadians, he proclaimed that any inhabitants caught with firearms would be treated as rebels to his majesty. Obviously, considering this is an intent to murder someone if they had a gun, Acadians surrendered almost 3,000 guns. These guns were seized, and then the deportation began. Now, these two facts may lead into the narrative that the right wing likes to build, and that gun control is one of the first steps to genocide. You know, you give up your guns, and then you get genocided because you didn't have guns. But it should be noted that since the mid-1740s, the Acadians and the Wabanaki Confederacy had been waging a guerrilla war against the British. So this wasn't the first step. They were already fighting in certain cases. And the Acadians who did hand over their guns did so pretty much under the express threat of death without it being said so. So if you were to claim that this gun control measure was the only thing stopping the Acadians from being systematically destroyed, you were ignoring the efforts of real-life people who put their lives on the line before this moment to save their people. That being said, this pre-confederation example of gun control set a template that the colonial experiment of Canada would follow for nearly the next 200 years. Another notable example of pre-confederation gun control was an 1845 act designed to disarm canal workers. See, in the 1840s on Northern Turtle Island, the province of Canada contracted workers to build several canals. The amount of jobs that were available were far under the number of people who came looking for work on these projects. This caused notable tensions around the subject of canals and the labor involved, which inflamed the already strained relationship between Catholics and Protestants and a lot of the immigrant workers who had come in from Ireland. Those who worked on the canals were not as lucky to have a job as you may think, and these large groups of unhappy men, angry at the poor wages and treatment, and the fact that they were immigrants, didn't sit well with the English institutions. The bill which was directed specifically at canal workers was supported by Edward Hale, an English-educated businessman at the time. He stated that it was quote, well known that the Irish were warm-blooded and apt to quarrel. Now, it wasn't as clear-cut as this. There were those who spoke out against it. For example, Lewis Drummond, who was a Catholic Irish-born lawyer, called it a tyrannical and arbitrary measure. But before you go and call Lewis Drummond the woke king of the province of Canada, it should be noted that he meant this right for property protection with firearms only for British citizens, who were presumably white. And not like Irish white, like disparaging beans on toast is like slapping the queen white. In his view, laborers had no property to protect, they were too poor to acquire any, and therefore it was better that a little should be sacrificed to prevent the loss of a single life or the commission of an act of violence. Drummond's overt comments suggest that a limited right to bear arms to protect property was a relatively common view in the mid-1840s. No member of the assembly, it should be noted, spoke against such a right. <laughs> The attitude at the time was clear through this. British citizens who owned firearms to protect their property were allowed to do so, unlike those who weren't part of the privileged and moneyed classes. This was the standard of the time. In fact, rifle shooting was considered a noble pursuit for those of the middle class and up who could afford it. But that was it. There were no poor people at rifle ranges at this time. Around this time is when we start to see the enforcement of guns as an imperialist and masculine endeavor. The British Columbians stated that there was, quote, something noble and manly in being able to defend oneself. Young men should be trained to defend this, their adopted soil. The Globe tied the practice in with masculinity, stating, quote, as a manly sport, practice with the rifle has no equal. Fuck me. I am struggling with this lighting so much. If you know somebody who likes things, don't direct them to me because I don't have money to pay them. Now, this is pretty clear-cut in the way a lot of gun rights advocates cite certain documents to say that gun ownership is a right, from the 1700s until pretty much today. Now, Canada doesn't have a foundational document that has like a passage like the Second Amendment where it says that there's a right to own arms, but pre-1867, when they were considered British citizens, they were technically underneath the English Bill of Rights, which was passed in 1689. And in the English Bill of Rights, it states that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense, suitable to their conditions, and as allowed by law. Jesus, that's a heavy shadow. I even found this justification in a source which I used for the latter half of this video series. It was published on the Hill Times, and it was titled, Brief History of Canada's Gun Laws. And it was hosted on the NFA's website. For those who don't know, the NFA is the National Firearms Association of Canada, so... 
a little bit biased. While both parts one and two are good resources, and I did use some information from them in the latter half of this video series, it should be taken with a grain of salt considering the motives and the fact that it's hosted on the NFA's website. And the biggest signifier for this is that part two ends with this paragraph. The 1995 Firearms Act, like every other piece of restrictive gun control legislation introduced since Confederation, has certainly failed to stop armed crime or eliminate illegally owned weapons. But that is not the point. The point is that successive Canadian governments purportedly fearful of mayhem and social upheaval gradually deprived the Canadian public of a right to be armed that had been a part of common law heritage recognized in Britain's Bill of Rights of 1689. It states, the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense suitable to their condition and as allowed by law. Now, this paragraph out of context may look bad, and I encourage you to read the whole articles just because they're actually well written, like I said earlier, but this paragraph is almost nonsense, and it directly contradicts itself. Canadian governments deprive the Canadian public of a right to be armed. The subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense, suitable to their conditions, and as allowed by law. These two statements are in direct conflict with one another. Governments create laws, as the Canadian government has created laws for gun control, so under those laws, guns are still allowed, just under certain stipulations. Of course, this is the least ridiculous part of this. Uh, let's focus in on this. Uh, Canadians are no longer British citizens, or all Protestant, and even if you were to say, well, before 1867 this applied and it was uh, the inalienable right, you just admitted that Protestant British people were the only people allowed to have guns. It literally says, yes for Protestant British people, no for everybody else. I don't know why I keep wearing suits, it gets really hot. In 1867, a series of very long-winded and boring lectures in high school resulted in the Confederation of Canada. It joined the province of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and the then province of Canada into the nation of Canada. And the province was split into Ontario and Quebec. Long story short, Canada officially became a thing in 1867. And no, no indigenous people were at these talks. And in fact, up until 1960, the only way an indigenous person could vote in Canadian elections was if they renounced their Indian status. And I do mean that literally because in 1870, Canada passed the Indian Act, which is still in use today. And Boy, I don't have enough time to go into that in this video, and I probably am not the one that should be telling you about it. Tons of indigenous people have written about it. I encourage you to look that up. For the purposes of this video, we can see that the colonial project of Canada became a unified entity in 1867. Gun control immediately followed the path that had been set before Confederation, with politicians like John A. Macdonald, noted racist, and Edward Blake suggesting that British subjects were granted a right to arms from the English Bill of Rights. This is like we mentioned earlier. A year after Canada was created, in 1868, the first Canadian Militia Act was passed. This ensured an act of Canadian militia of 40,000 British subjects. 370,170 volunteers joined, with 618,896 technically serving in the reserve. Between 1875 and 1896, 20,000 men attended per year on average. While the militia did have very limited arms, they were granted to those who served. This was alongside a jump in recreational shooting for Canadian riflemen. In fact, after the decrease in US gunmanship after a sort of scuffle they had in the 1860s or whatever, Canadians became the de facto crack shots in North America. In fact, Canadians have been such an asset in firearm accuracy that Americans of the time noted that Canadian rifle associations had made Canadians better crack shots than Americans were at the time. The New York Times, for instance, asserted that the Canadian policy of providing long rifle ranges had developed a large and formidable force for national defense. Canada had 45,000 marksmen among its volunteer forces, while the United States had none. In 1875, it was recalled how the appearance of Canadian riflemen a few years earlier was talked about almost in bated breath and with awe and reverence. This may come as a shock to many of you, as it certainly did to me, but this has more implications than just a colonizer dick measuring contest. The National Rifle Association had been founded around this time and was chartered in New York on November 18, 1871. But after such time, the NRA sent delegations to the UK, Germany, and Canada to research how rifle associations and clubs operated in those countries. This was more than just a research trip, and according to Forest and Stream, an American journal focused on hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation, Canadian riflemen, quote, taught us practically our 
our first rifle lessons. Canada acted as, quote, our foster mother, and we, as her children in the rifle school, owe her a lasting debt of gratitude. Not only that, but the NRA's founders were so enamored with Canadian gun culture that Canadian riflemen helped draw up the plans for the first NRA gun range in Creedmoor, New York, 1872. You know what that means. Canadians were instrumental in creating the NRA. But that's simply the upper middle class white British settlers who were encouraged by the Canadian state to own and operate guns. Despite institutional treaties promising chiefs of indigenous tribes with Winchester rifles, the state largely suppressed the use of firearms by those they thought might use guns against them. Consider the Northwest Rebellion of 1885, in which Métis and First Nations formed a five-month revolt against the Canadian government. In it, they asserted that the Métis had rights of possessions to their farms, and they exchanged gunfire in many confrontations and battles. So after the Canadian government defeated the rebellion and hanged its leader, the populace kicked the racism into overdrive. The Toronto World, a newspaper at the time, declared, The Indians of the Northwest should be immediately disarmed in order to fully secure settlers against damage and danger. The fact is that no Indian should be allowed to have a rifle at all. And if that doesn't drive your dog crazy, the Calgary Weekly Herald brought out the bullhorn and stated, If this country is to be made habitable for white men, the government must disarm all the Indians. Despite this, the government was actually hesitant to send any hard and fast law about gun control until 1892. The reason for this is that John A. Macdonald, noted drunk and racist piece of shit, was opposed to gun control in any form during his time in office. He believed disarming British slash Canadian citizens left them open to Americans and their rowdy violence. That being said, considering how the infamous genocidal residential school system was commissioned and taking off in 1884, you can tell this wasn't done with indigenous people in mind. While specific instances of seizing guns or preventing their sale to indigenous people aren't noted, context dictates there was far from a modern egalitarian attitude. Less Less than noble impulses motivated most gun control measures in the quarter century after the Confederation. Legislators, for instance, designed most pistol laws to discourage young working class men from carrying revolvers. Canadian politicians suggested that men posed a serious threat to Canadian order, especially during periods of ethnic, religious, and class conflict. On the other hand, many parliamentarians believed that people of property had a constitutional right to possess arms. Legislators thus ensured that respectable citizens could defend their lives and property against the reckless. That 1892 piece of legislation that I referred to was the first criminal code in Canada, and it dictated that you needed to have a basic permit to carry a pistol unless you had cause to fear assault or injury. Masculinity was always an integral attachment to the use of guns in the 1800s, but in the 1890s we really see the concept begin the process of commodification. The H.P. Davies Company of Toronto advertised to sportsmen as early as 1893 they were selling rifles, ammo, decoy ducks, hunting equipment, and the next year began advertising apparel, gun cases, game bags, knives, and flasks. This is notable because this is the beginning of tying gun culture not just to masculinity or nation, but to a consumerist identity itself. Surprisingly enough, while men were the main target of this push, middle class women also began their gun culture as well. In fact, a rifle club opened in Charlottetown, and by 1915 there was a Toronto Women's Revolver Club. But to emphasize their femininity, these women dressed up in Victorian garb to participate in the sport. This was also defended by newspapers of the day. The Globe noting in 1902 that while the average girl is afraid of firearms, there were women who participated in gun culture, and that, quote, belonging to a rifle club need not and does not make a girl tomboyish. But while rifle sports were seen as proper and noble for middle-class Canadians, two issues were boiling over in the public sphere. The first of which was the availability of handguns. Charles Allen Stewart of the Supreme Court of Alberta commented, quote, it is beyond my understanding why a revolver is allowed to be sold. There ought to be a law passed to do away with such things. But another issue had begun to take hold in the minds of Canadians. In the immediate years after Confederation, a lot of focus was put on urban young men and indigenous people owning firearms. But now, there was a new scapegoat. Immigrants. Immigrants. I knew it was them. Even when it was the bears, I knew it was them. Lots of established Canadians had claimed that a new influx of immigrants outside of the British Isle, Northern Europe, and the United States had cultural predispositions to violence. The Montreal Gazette in 1911, for instance, commented on a recent shooting that the, quote, Italian with a revolver has added another to a somewhat long list of murders for which his countrymen in the city are responsible. Likewise, the Toronto Star stated that recent immigrants needed to be taught that, quote, They must not practice revolver shooting on Sunday as we have no czars and grand dukes to assassinate, 
really not as indispensably necessary that a resident should know how to shoot as it seems in Russia. Which, I mean, maybe they should. This boiled over in 1913, where in British Columbia, the provincial game warden Brian Williams suggested that men carrying firearms had increased, and that this was to be blamed on, quote, bad foreign elements. He listed the culprits as, quote, Japanese, Chinese, Hindus, etc. He wrote in a game law amendment that year that heavily restricted foreigners from owning guns. Now, what's interesting about this law that should be applied to all laws in the future is this. It did not explicitly ban foreigners from buying, owning, or operating firearms. But what it did do was practically prevent foreign workers from owning and operating firearms. If you were a resident or a non-resident, you still had to get a license. But if you had been in BC for less than six months, you had to pay a lot more than somebody who had been there longer. Now, this didn't explicitly say foreign workers will not be able to afford firearm licenses because we charge them more and they're paid so little, but that's the practical effect that it had. Just keep that in mind for laws that you may see that don't have explicitly racist language, but may have an intentional racist effect. This law was emblematic of the rest of the provincial efforts to limit firearms, with the primary goal of limiting immigrants' access to them. In 1911, the Offensive Weapons Act was passed in Ontario, which required the buyer to get a certificate under S-118 of the Criminal Code, or a permit from the superintendent of the OPP or local chief constable. Among many other fines and additions, it allowed Ontario police to search for weapons and seize any that were carried illegally. It also mandated that whenever it was an immigrant with an illegal weapon, they needed to report it to the Minister of the Interior, quote, with the view towards deporting such a person under the Immigration Act. Similar acts were passed in 1912 by Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and as previously mentioned, British Columbia in 1913. While the Conservative Party was elected into power in 1911, it finally got the hint and passed a federal measure that was similar to these provincial ones in 1913. And these measures worked in their goals. As R. Blake Brown noted, There were just 68 prosecutions for carrying unlawful weapons in 1893, but 1,085 in 1913, and the prosecution of many immigrants contributed to the spike. From 1892 to 1899, only 6.6% of those convicted came from outside the British Empire or the United States. In comparison, between 1910 and 1913, 40.2% of those convicted originated from outside the British Empire and the United States. So there you have it. A history of gun control in Canada from pre-Confederation up until about 1914. And if you're using your newly mandated textbooks from Jason Kenney in the Alberta Education Curriculum, you'll note that absolutely nothing of note happened in 1914. Sorry, there's a... There was... No. There... A what? No. Hi everyone, if you made it this far, thanks for watching my video. Uh, give it a like, give it a subscribe. Um, I cannot stress enough how much work I put into this series uh, alone compared to my other videos. Um, so much research. I wrote, I wrote an article from the research I was doing for this video in the meantime, which has never happened to me before. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm gonna make this either a three or a four part series. I'm not entirely sure just yet. Um, I'm leaning towards four, but there's just so much research that needs to go into the subject. Uh, and speaking of research, I cannot recommend the book Arming and Disarming A History of C Gun Control in Canada by R. Blake Brown enough. It was absolutely foundational to this video, especially because there were very few resources on gun control in Canada to start with, let alone resources on gun control in Canada pre-1900. Uh, so this book, this part of the video was almost entirely because of that book. So I highly recommend you read it, check it out. I would hold it up physically, but I rented it from my local library and it took me like a month and a half. Uh, so I had to return it before they sent me another threatening email. I wanted to give a shout out to um, the artist who created this. It is Zo. They are part. Of, uh, their handle on Twitter is Biased Soy Motel, which is just fantastic. It's a uh, Kirby Marks, and I believe they'll be putting up uh, a Redbubble link if you'd like to buy it yourself. Cannot recommend it enough. I almost cried when I saw this. Uh, my partner gave it to me as a gift, and uh, you know what, Zo, you fucking nailed it. So thank you so much. I wanted to thank Jess at Cuddlesome Kraken, uh, Joe at the Joe Toscano, and Bunt at Indigo Bunting St for their voices. Um, I had to do this after I recorded everything, so I forgot. Um, I'm going to stop with the ASMR now. Um, anyway, uh, anything else? Uh, no. Um, you can follow me at you caught Scott on Twitter or Instagram. Um, and you can read stuff I've written. 
and you're gonna look forward to the next video, which if my calculations are correct, will be out approximately 2086.